Good afternoon. Hello. Those are our friends in uh, Washington, DC. Can you hear them? So we have some folks joining us. We so, can hear you. OK, you can mute your mic then. Thank you. Good, mo good afternoon. I'm Diane Janicek from the National Security Agency. We have a special treat today, but before we get started, please stand for the arrival of the official party and the singing of the national anthem. Oh, girls, <laughs> Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we have at the twilight's last meaning whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the Thank you girls for that beautiful rendition of the National Anthem. Thank you again, I'm Diane Janicek. It is with great pleasure that I'm introducing you to the very, very special guest of today, Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson. On behalf of the President of Dakota State University who is unable to be here, President Griffiths, on, to, on behalf of the Director of the National Security Agency, General Paul Nakasone, and on behalf of the National Science Funda Foundation, welcome Secretary Wilson to today. The Gen Cyber 2018 Girls in Cyber Security. I know Secretary Wilson's already finding out these are an amazing group of girls and multi-talented. As we can see, they even uh, uh, they volunteered in the National Anthem for us, which is just awesome. So as we know, Dakota State is here in Madison, South Dakota. DSU is a national center for academic excellence in both cyber operations and cyber defense. Quite an extraordinary institution that all these lucky girls get to be here. So let me introduce to you, um, tell you a little bit about Secretary Wilson. She's quite phenomenal. She's currently the 24th Secretary of the Air Force. So she's responsible, for those that may not know about the Air Force too much, she's responsible for the Department of the Air Force, the training and equipping of a workforce of 670,000 people, active duty, guard, reserve, and civilian forces. So now you're all math wizards, right? So guess how many, you wrap your head around this number. She le oversees the budget of the Air Force of $138 billion. So how many zeros is that? You? How many zeros? And someone else help her over there? Nine zeros. That's $138 billion has got nine zeros. That's a lot of money. So she has 35 years of professional experience, um, and she was a career first. 
So there are a lot of you that are super smart. I've already met you all and you're just fantastic. So I'm gonna tell you a list of a bunch of firsts and these are only what I know. So she probably even has more what she could share with you. She is someone you can truly aspire to. She is so cool that even though she's a secretary of the Air Force and they give her her own plane, as you probably already know, she even has a commercials pilot and could fly the plane. That's just amazing, right? So she graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1982. She was the first woman to command basic training. She was then the first woman to be a vice wing commander. She was the first female veteran to serve a full term in Congress. Is this amazing already? We're not even, we're not even done yet. So she was the first Air Force grad to serve as a secretary of the Air Force. And she was the first female president of the South Dakota School of Mines. Is that not outstanding? Amazing. So she's, as the first secretary of the Air Force, she was one of the first in the service secretaries to be confirmed by bipartisan support, overwhelmingly, and some other amazing facts. She served on the National Security Council. She's an author. She even wrote a book on international law and the use of force. She's gotten awards for that and accolades for that. And she's had many names. She's amazing. Dr. Wilson, she has a PhD. She was a Rhodes Scholar. President Wilson is part of South Dakota School of Mines. Congressman Wilson, five-term congresswoman from South Dakota. Impressive. Secretary Wilson, in her current capacity, and she's also a mother. And when she was confirmed, you know what everyone's called her? A patriot. Now that is just, I mean, amazing. Talking about being able to have someone to, to aspire to. So before I turn it over to her, I wanted to say, so why is this so much? It's not just titles and like awards, right? She's dedicated to students and women. She's loyal to national security and the economic security of our country. She recognizes cybersecurity as both a national security issue and an economic security issue. It affects all walks of life, all industries across the United States. So she's a true patriot. She has a good sense of humor. She's personable. She's politically savvy. She knows how to get things done. She can run all around that, um, that Pentagon and she knows who to see and get everything's done. She's amazing. She's a caring person and a loving mother. So our nation is truly grateful to have her at the helm of the Air Force, truly. So she is a rock star. She continues to break new ground. This is the first service secretary we've ever had come to a Gen Cyber Camp. So even though she's used to having lots of men and women airmen out there, I know this group of girls can give her the biggest round of applause she's ever gotten. Let's <laughs> Okay, I want to understand a little bit. Can you hear me? Is this like working? Is that okay? Um, a little bit about how many of you are go, like, so this is going into so going into ninth grade, eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth grade. Anybody younger? Go fifth grade. Anybody going into fifth grade? So. So okay, so pretty much anybody older than ninth grade, anybody going into tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade. Okay, okay, that gives me an idea. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Heather Wilson, as you as you just heard, um, and it's really good to be back in South Dakota. Uh, I actually loved being a president of the School of Mines here, but I want to talk to you all a little bit about what the world's going to be like. Um, Maybe when you're ancient like me. Um, but I want to talk about that. When I was a kid in high school, I really loved locks. And you think about this, just within like probably, oh, I can see at least two locks just from where I'm standing. I really just thought they were interesting little mechanical devices. And they're everywhere, right? You have them on your home, you have them in your car, you've got them on a briefcase, on your light, you know, just they're on your bike, right? So they're everywhere. I just thought they were kind of interesting things. And so I learned how to pick locks. It was nice, but I was never put in jail. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of cool. But you think about this. Um, the lock was invented 2,000 years ago. And it was really a pretty simple device. It was actually invented by the Romans about 2,000 years ago. And for over 1,900 years, it really didn't change much. It was the same mechanical device. And then in about 1940, there were some innovations that happened. You went from that device that you see kind of like over there on the far left of the screen 
to the cylinder lock, which is kind of what you see in a door. Or even, you know, now, of course, you're, you don't even have, most of you probably don't even in the, on your parents' car. You're so, didn't you remember having to open a car door with a key? You do? Like way back when you were in elementary school? Well, th those kind of locks, those are cylinder locks. So that was like a big innovation. So for, for 1,900 years, the lock didn't change. And then it changed significantly. And today, so, so for your room key here, do you have an actual metal key or do you have a piece of plastic? You have a key. Well, have you ever been to a hotel where you use a piece of plastic? Pretty amazing, huh? So just, so we went over 1,900 years where they're being the same, and then a minor modification, and now today we use a piece of plastic. So to be a locksmith, when I was in high school and was kind of interested in this stuff, took only a high school degree and an apprenticeship. Today, you think about what it takes to swipe that key and get into your hotel room. And where is this going tomorrow? Now, there are doors in the Pentagon that depend on key codes. There are other doors and things that depend on my fingerprint. Or you now walk through Dulles Airport, and it takes a picture of you. And then it saves that picture. Keys are changing. And what was required to be able to pick a lock or build a lock when I was in high school profoundly different today from to what today and what you're gonna to have to deal with. You know, and to and to do what we've got to do tomorrow, it's gonna to take computer science and material science and biology and electrical engineering, a whole lot more than it took when I was in high school to be able to be a locksmith. Same kind of acceleration of innovation we see in aviation. I didn't even plan that sentence that way, by the way. Um, the airplane was, uh, the Wright brothers took off from, from Kitty Hawk. They were, grew up in Dayton, Ohio. They were a couple of bicycle mechanics. And they actually had a sister named Catherine, who was one of the ones who, you never hear about Catherine Wright. But she was actually the one who really enabled them to be able to do what they did with their inventions. And she was responsible for a lot of their international sales, particularly for the French. She was only, the only one of the Wrights, by the way, who went to college. And she became a high school teacher. And so, uh, so the Wright brothers took off in 1903. Um, and uh, I, you know, the, so the first powered human flight was in 1903. That's actually a picture of one of the early women barnstormers. Her, her name was Eleanor Smith. There was actually a large number of women who were barnstormers in the early days of aviation. And then, so, so just in one lifetime, my grandfather flew in the First World War. He was a pilot, started flying in 1918. And he lived to see a man walk on the moon. Think about it, in one lifetime. By the 1950s, we were flying jet engines and jet airplanes. That's Jackie Cochran. She still holds some of the, uh, the most flying records held by any single individual held by Jackie Cochran, man or woman. Most flying records for altitude and distance and all kinds of other things. And then today, that's Christine Mao. She's our first woman F-35 pilot in the United States Air Force. She, by the way, is not really flying an airplane. She's flying a computer. The F-35 is a high-performance computer wrapped up in a stealth airplane. That's how much things have changed in just a little over two lifetimes. The world has changed. My grandfather had a, had a grade school education. And he became a pilot. I flew in the First World War and the Second World War. My father had a high school degree and went into the service and then became a commercial pilot after leaving the Air Force. What was good enough for your parents is not good enough for you. You're going to need a lot more education. These are computers. So I graduated from college in 1982, which was the year after the introduction by IBM, a company called IBM, the first personal computer. Um, when I did computer science at the Air Force Academy, we actually had these, I know, no kidding, these decks of like index cards, right? 
and, uh, and you punched in your code on these index cards, and you gotta make sure that you didn't drop your deck of cards and get them all out of order. So you, the lines of code you, I saw you all working on this morning, think that every one of those lines was punched on a card, and then to debug your program, you've gotta get your cards in order. And think about what happens if you drop your deck of cards. And if your code is thousands of lines long, you've gotta have a card for every line. That's what computer science was when I was taking computer science at the Air Force Academy. It has completely changed in just my time as a professional. So this, I always think, what has computing changed? And what has changed about life? I always think these things are interesting. It was a, so in 1900, so at the turn of the last century, what was the life expectancy of people in that year? And what were the leading causes of death? I think these are kind of funny, because you know the top causes of death in 1900, first one was flu and pneumonia, second one was tuberculosis, and the third one was diarrhea, believe it or not. I mean, that even sounds silly to us now, right? It was before the invention of antibiotics. So you could die for a lot more things. And computing power has changed healthcare for all of us. I always like this map. It's, you know, you kind of think, what the heck did they do to this map? So in, 19, in 1804, there were about a billion people on this planet. And in 2050, there'll be about 10 billion. And this, this map is skewed to show where that population will be. So instead of the regular map that you kind of see, what they did was they took the projection of how many people are going to be living in those countries and kind of adjusted the size of the country to look at where the population is going to be. So what does that mean for all of you? 10 billion people on this planet. What does it mean for food and for energy and for health care, for the businesses that you run? It means technology. And the solutions provided by technology are going to help all of us enable the solution of problems in your lifetime. So what does it mean for you? What do you, um, so somebody here who's one of my, my high school students, what are you planning to do after high school, when you graduate high school? Well, that was a quiz, so yeah, go to college, good answer. Do you know what you want to study yet? What? Pre-med and computer science. It's a really good choice um, because healthcare is gonna be enabled by computer science in ways that it certainly wasn't at the time. My mother was a, was a nurse, but at the time she went through nursing school, it was a two-year apprenticeship program and you didn't even have a bachelor's degree to be a nurse. Today, the level of education that's required to be a nurse or to be a doctor is completely different from what it was for my mother's generation. How about somebody else? What do you want to do? Yeah, right here, yeah. You want to be a NASA engineer? What kind of an engineer? That's okay. Just keep moving in that direction. Yeah, what do you want to do? A marine biologist? Where are you from? Arkansas. You gotta get closer to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, what do you want to be? You're gonna be an astronaut. All right. You know something? Here's my prediction. You and your generation are gonna have the opportunity to live on the moon in preparation for going to Mars. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Up at the back, yeah. That's not bad too. When I was your age, when I was in middle school, I wanted to be an inhalation therapist. And the reason that I wanted to do that was because nobody knew what it was. They never asked me any more questions. <laughs> and I, I was a volunteer at the hospital, and I, I read it on somebody's door. And I just thought that was, uh, I didn't really know what it was, but um, it stopped people asking me any more questions about what I wanted to be, because I didn't really know. Yeah. Yeah. Pediatric brain surgeon. That's a lot of school. <laughs> and good. What else? You know something? 
This, uh, I heard, found this out last night. For the first time this year, microsurgery was done in Romania on a patient who needed surgery, and the surgeons were in the United States, and they did it over the internet. Think about that for a second. So if you're the best in the world, your patients don't have to come to you. They did the surgery over the internet. Yeah. You want to be an animal rights lawyer. So my husband's a lawyer. Despite that, he's a nice guy. <laughs> we need good lawyers. But, but, but you should also think about this. If you're here, it's because you've got some, some skills and abilities in science, engineering, or math. Some of the most valued lawyers are patent lawyers, but you have to be an engineer first and then go to law school. And my, you know, my husband does, did uh, a different kind of law, and then he, on the side for free, he did child welfare law. So he was able to make a living doing something that was highly valuable, and then with his, um, with his uh, philanthropic time, did something for children. And you may want to think about that, because you've got some skills and abilities, and you get some gifts beyond just the law. And I say that I have a PhD or related international law, so I can say that, right? Yeah. What kind of an engineer do you know? That's the right answer, a one that makes a difference. You know, that's one of the things about engineering, and I got to say this. I used to be the president of an engineering school. Sometimes I think we talk about engineering in this way that, I, I could say this in this room, that appeals more to boys than to girls. Because we never, it's like we solve really cool problems, but we never say why, right? Um, we do engineering to make the world better, right? To solve diseases, to clean the water, to build roads so that people are less likely to drive their car off the edge and kill themselves, to build devices that solve people's health problems. We're engineers and scientists because it makes the world better. We're the people that we love. And it's OK to talk about engineering that way. Yeah. A marine biologist. Where are you from? South Dakota. We got all these marine biologists that need to get closer to water. <laughs> what do you want to do? No, not allowed. All right, so here's the deal. What do you play for music? Percussion, oboe, trombone, and I'm things. Okay, I want you to think about this. People who are gifted in mathematics and science are also very often gifted in music. It's very hard to make a living with your music. There are a lot of people, and I say this, so, so I love Dakota State, but I also love the School of Mines. There are more all-state musicians at the School of Mines than any other campus in South Dakota and has a great music program and no music majors because they're all engineers and scientists who do music because they love it. So think about how you use your gifts, not just in your professional life, but your professional life to then enable your, your broader life. So I told you my husband's a lawyer. He's also an oboe player. Um, he never would have made it as a professional oboe player. And he probably wouldn't have been a very good band director. Um, but uh, music was just part of his life. It's actually, we met going to a Broadway musical. It's a long story. But, um, but uh, so you can take the things you love that may not be something that can, you know, could support you in our family. And my brother is also a musician. Um, but to be able to, to combine it with something, you've got a lot of gifts. So your life, I think, anybody here still play with Rubik's Cubes? Now, just think about this. So if you were all a Rubik's Cube, sometimes people are going to see you as one side of the cube, like you're a musician. But my guess is you're also, you've got other sides to your cube, right? So, so don't ever lose sight of having different gifts. It's OK to have different gifts. And then you just figure out how to use them all in a rich life. Yeah. Programmer and author are both. And, and they're, now they're the same thing, right? Some of the most creative writers I know write code, right? Yeah, yeah. You're going to be a radiologist for those of us who get sick, right? Some of the neatest inventions in radiology and combine radiology and computing. 
um, because it's about, in fact, the Air Force has done some of this work because we look at patterns and things like weather maps and other things, and you gotta be, and, uh, you gotta be able to look at, at, use the computer to look at the thing that matters. So you're all, uh, you all sometime in high school or when you're in college, you'll start getting annual exams, women all, we all do them, and one of them we have is mammogram. It's really hard to read a mammogram just with the human eye, but there are now tools enabled by computing to be able to identify cancer earlier by using the computer to detect where the mistake is in the human, human flesh. So computing and radiology go together too. Yeah, up here. Meteorologist. <clears throat> so you're gonna be studying the weather and the patterns in the weather and chasing storms. It's very important for pilots as well. So you think about it, it's probably the most important thing for aviation is the weather. Yeah, but we run satellites. The Air Force runs 77 satellites. 10 of those are weather satellites. Um, so it's connected to space as well. And um, many of our people who are running satellites are, we run satellites from the ground through a computer network um, that, uh, that, and you think about it, all right, you know the blue dot on your phone? Where does the blue dot on your phone come from? Anybody know? Where? Um, from the satellite, from the satellites, it's about um, bouncing, bouncing the radio or, or Wi-Fi signals goes from a, from a receiver to a... And who provides that to you? Uh, Technically, I guess the satellite. I guess the satellite. Who runs those satellites? Come on. You guys. United States Air Force runs those satellites. <laughs> nope, the Air Force does. We put those up. Um, and in, in 1983, there was an airplane that uh, strayed off its navigation course and was actually shot down by the Soviet Union over, over um, it was a Korean airliner. And at that time, the president at that time said, okay, you know, that signal that was originally only meant for military use. And at that time, they declassified her. Our, uh, it was, it was. You guys are all coders. It was, uh, it was protected by code. It was, uh, you know, there was a key, right? Um, we unlocked it, and that code became available to everyone. So the blue dot on your phone is provided by. We have 33 satellites. Uh, they are run by a, a Space Command out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. There are 40 people in the United States Air Force that run GPS for the world, a billion people a day use that network, and it's the blue dot on your phone. So that system can tell you within about a meter where you are on the surface of the Earth, as long as you can see four of those satellites. It's all math. It's all math and computing power, but it takes 40 people, average age 22. They're all airmen. They're all members of the United States Air Force. What are you gonna do when you grow up? You want to build the rockets for NASA? You can do that for NASA. You can also do it for companies. Anybody, SpaceX? Any of you uh, seen the SpaceX launches? Yep, private company building space, space uh, launches. ULA is another one, Boeing. There's a lot of fantastic companies that are doing a lot of great innovation. The Air Force now, we don't build rockets. We just buy launches from private companies. So we just announced this last week, our next launch, our next satellite, is going up on a SpaceX rocket. Pretty cool, yeah. Want to be an entrepreneur? Do you know what kind of, what's your first business going to be? You already have it, what's your business? Great, keep going. Just keep solving problems. Yeah, what are you going to be? I want to be Three marine biologists, okay, what state are you from? Texas, well at least you have some coastline. You gotta <laughs> talk to these. Yeah. Civil engineers, yes. We have a huge need for civil engineers. Um, my daughter is studying civil engineering. She's actually working this summer um, on an internship uh, on water. Um, and she's a civil engineer because she knows the solves problems that matter to people. Uh, so she, uh, she did a Semester abroad, she just got back from Edinburgh. She was at Harriet and Watt University, a great engineering university. Watt was the great Scottish engineer um, who, uh, who uh, built the steam engine and started the university, but she, he, she just came back from a semester abroad and she's, she's gonna be a civil engineer and probably build water projects. Wants to build water projects um, in developing countries. It's kinda cool. Hi, yeah, what are you gonna do? Say again. 
Civil engineer, now who else is gonna be a civil engineer? How many civils, do you want, no, just a couple? Great, there's a, there's a lot of, there, we have a huge need in this country for civil engineers, yeah. So you wanna be an uh, uh, oncologist, and, oncologist and cancer doctor. Who else, yeah. Neurosurgeon, we had a couple of neurosurgeons here. Yeah. Psychologist, help people like me get my head on straight. Yeah. Software engineer, huge need for software engineers. Everything is a sensor and everything is connected. Um, without software engineers, we're not even gonna be able to function in the 21st century. Yeah. Digital artist, great. Over here, veterinarian, fantastic. Oh, okay. Oh, I would like to be a computer scientist. Fantastic. Who else from GW? Anybody else from GW want to come up? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Say what you want to do. I want to be a chemical oh, engineer when I grow up. Yes! <laughs> Anybody else from Washington GW? <laughs> Some kind of biologist. A biologist, fantastic. Is that a computer problem there? I want to be a vulnerability researcher. Say that again for me. A vulnerability researcher. Vulnerability researcher. That's interesting. What do you mean by that? What kind of vulnerabilities? Computer vulnerabilities. Computer vulnerabilities, got it, okay. You can be anything you wanna be. You can be anything you wanna be. Not society's dream for who you should be, but your own very personal dream of who you are and who you wanna become. So, do any of you have questions of me or things that you want to know? Yeah. Or Ashley, do you want to help me with this or do you want me to just keep on here? Okay. So maybe Ashley's going to help me in case the George Washington students have any questions and stuff and we can, we can do that. Any question you want, I, I don't, it doesn't, it can be about, it can be about anything. My favorite color is blue, by the way. So. And I like macaroni and cheese. But beyond that, you can ask me anything you want. Anything you want. Okay. Were you ever treated differently because of your gender? Was I ever treated differently because of my gender? Yes, I was. Um, and uh, you know, I went to the Air Force Academy in the third class with women. And at the time I went there, there were some people who didn't think girls should be at the Air Force Academy. Um, and uh, so I figured that that was their problem, not my problem. Um, and um, I just didn't let it bother me too much and just tried to just keep, you know, sometimes it, feel, it may feel unfair and it may feel as though, gosh, I have to be twice as good in order to be given half the credit. And so I thought, piece of cake, I'll just be twice as good. <laughs> no, I just didn't think of it as my problem. That was somebody else's problem. And I just, uh, just kept it going and also tried to make sure that I kept the doors open for everybody else as we go along the way. Yeah. When you joined the Air Force, did you think that the woman could make a bigger difference on the world if they all joined together, like the men and the women? Uh, say that again and bring the mic a little bit closer to you. Did you think that like adding the women to the Air Force, did you feel like you guys would make like a huge difference also? Like Because like I feel like women make a big difference. In the yeah, world, and we so. were talking about it a little bit at lunch. Um, uh, so I didn't anticipate going back to federal service and becoming secretary of the Air Force. I was, that was not, it's not like a job I applied for or something. And I'll tell you the story. So 
So I was here as the president of a university, the South Dakota School of Mines in Rapid City, absolutely loved it. And um, Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, James Mattis called me and he said, uh, this is Jim Mattis and uh, I wanna talk to you about becoming Secretary of the Air Force. And honest to goodness, this is what he said. I said, uh, sir, you know that being a college president is like the best job in America, right? And he said, yeah, I know, I just came from Stanford. <laughs> and uh, we talked, we had several phone conversations. But I believe that all of us have gifts. And we have an obligation to steward our gifts in the service of our community and of others, and of our country. And uh, if I believe that, and I have someone like Secretary Mattis say, I need you to do this, and I don't, then I'm a fraud. And so, so I was asked to serve, and um, so I left South Dakota Mines and um, returned, or as they say in the Air Force, I rejoined the formation to uh, try to provide some leadership to the Air Force. When you were younger, yeah, no, sorry, it's okay. When you were younger, did you always know what you wanted to be? No, did I know what? I, in fact, some days I think I still don't know what I want to be. Um, um, like I said, when I was in middle school, I really didn't know, but I didn't want to be asked, so I said I wanted to be an inhalation therapist because that stopped people asking. And then uh, when I was in high school, I still, I knew I wanted to go to college, but nobody in my family had ever gone to college before. So it was, I wasn't, I knew I was going, but I didn't really know in what, and I was good in, uh, I was good in math and science, but I was also good in English and social, and I was a good student. Um, so I didn't really know. And then, when, like I said, when I was a junior in high school was when they opened the Air Force Academy to women. I, I, I applied to other universities as well. Um, when I was in high school, I thought maybe I wanted to be a lawyer because in the town that I grew up in, the only people who went to college with, that I knew were lawyers and doctors. So I didn't, I didn't know anything else that you could be. Um, so I didn't really know what was out there for me until I started going to college and seeing there's, man, there's a lot of things out here I can be. And, and so there's a lot of opportunities out there that you may not even know about yet. So just kind of keep building your skills and making decisions and be open to the new possibilities. Um, who was your biggest role model? Different role models at different times in my life. Um, my grandfather was very important to me. Um, I, my, so my, uh, my father died when I was very young. He was killed in a car accident. And but my grandfather was still alive. Um, uh, and he was a pilot. Uh, and so, so he was important to me and influenced me. But there were other role models that I found in books, too. Um, um, and if, you, if any of you like to read books and biographies, um, Blackberry Winter by Margaret Mead was one of my favorite um, biographies when I was probably in high school or early college. She was an anthropologist, a woman leader and scientist at, a, at, a, at an unusual time for women to be doing those kind of things. There's another great book called West with the Night that's, a, uh, that's about a, a woman who is a pilot in Africa um, uh, in the like 1930s, 1940s. So I found role models in books. And then I've had um, role models and mentors along the way as well, both women and men. Um, who've encouraged me or challenged me in some way. Question from GW. <laughs> you guys are muted. How do we unmute? There we go. Right here. What made you want to go into the Air Force? What made me want to go into the Air Force? Good question. Well, I told you my grandfather flew in the First World War, and then he came to America in 1922, and he was a barnstormer, and he opened airports, um, and was a commercial pilot, and he flew in the Second World War. And then my dad started flying when he was 13 years old, and he got his pilot's license when he was 16. And then he enlisted in the Air Force after high school. Um, and uh, so I grew up around a lot of flyers. Um, and so, so 
that was uh, really kind of my inspiration for being interested in aviation. I am a, I'm not a commercial pilot, I am a private pilot. My airplane is still here in South Dakota. Here's what's wrong with this picture. I'm Secretary of the Air Force and I can't fly any of the Air Force airplanes. So my, my airplane is still here in South Dakota. How old were you when you joined the Air Force? I was 17 when I joined the Air Force. One more from George Washington. GW. Is there another question from George Washington? Hi. What year did you join the Air Force? What year did I join the Air Force? It was like forever. It was 1978. <laughs> forever ago. It was in another century. Yeah. OK. Um, how many years of like college or like education did you have after like high school? Really good question. So I went to the Air Force Academy. The Air Force Academy, you go for four years and get a Bachelor of Science degree. So I told you I was, I was the first person in my family to go to college, so that was a really big deal. So I got a bachelor's degree. And then when I was there, um, I, um, I, I, one of my professors, so I had never, like I said, I didn't know many people who had gone to college. But somebody there said, you know, there's this scholarship you should apply for to go to graduate school. I thought, huh. Uh, you know, and the, but what he said first was, you know, if you weren't so busy and involved in all this stuff and doing so many things, you could apply for this scholarship. So what it really was was, you can't do this. And I thought, well, at least I'm going to find out what it is. And so uh, I looked into it. It was called the Rhodes Scholarship. And it was a full ride scholarship to go to Oxford University in England. And I got my master's degree there in two more years. And then the Air Force and the Rhodes Trust let me stay for a third year. And I got my doctoral degree there. So I had four years there and three years. But to me, and for your generation, education is going to be a lot more iterative and lifelong. So, so I've continued to learn things since I got my degrees, yeah. but I. You learn things both in the work that you do and also the coursework that you take along the way. So you've got a plan to be constantly learning and refreshing what you're doing, irrespective of the number of degrees and formal education. Two more questions. Oh. Uh, uh, how old were you when, I mean, not, I mean, not, sorry, not that old. Um, <laughs> how old? Uh, what Broadway show did you see when you met your husband? <laughs> what? What, what, Broadway what Broadway show? This is important what stuff. Okay, so so it became it started out as a joke. Um, uh, the the uh, show that we saw in New York together was City of Angels, which is a great Broadway show. But here was the thing. So I was actually this is the scandalous part. So my husband was actually one of my professors at the Air Force Academy. <laughs> But, but it took him nine years to ask me out on a date, so it wasn't really that bad. But, so he was this professor, and he was really funny. He was a really funny teacher. And um, one of my classmates, and he was making some point about the law, and one of my classmates said, answered one of his questions, and said, I don't even remember what it was about, but he said, like, something, something's busting out all over. My husband, who's an oboe player, and used to play in pit orchestras, but while he was studying for the bar exam, said, oh, sounds like that song from Oklahoma. And I, blur, I looked up and blurted out, I said, no, a carousel. Because June is busting out all over the song. That's from Carousel, it's not from Oklahoma. And my husband, who loves Broadway musicals, was amazed that he got it wrong, because he like, really loves Broadway. He was even more amazed that a, a I'll use a big word here, Philistine. It really means like, you know, narrow-minded. But a cadet would know anything about Broadway. <laughs> because we didn't, you know, and so, but I grew up in a family that loved Broadway musicals. And so, so, um, so it became like this running joke. And nine years later, when I came back to America, I lived in Europe, I, I worked for the Air Force in Europe, I came back to America, and he was coming to New York, and I had sent out all my change of address things to this old teacher friend of mine and that kind of thing. And he was coming to New York, and so he, he called me and he said, hey, I'm coming to New York. It was like this running joke. You want to go see a Broadway matinee? And I thought, ah, that'd be fun. And so I went up to see this old teacher friend of mine. 
And uh, um, we went to a Broadway matinee. We went to Dion's Pizza and had soda. And then I went back on the train to Washington, D.C., where I was working at the time. And I thought, oh, that was fun. Um, but I'll probably never hear from him again, right? Um, and, uh, and my husband, who, so, so, okay, so there's a lot less difference between 38 and 30, and by that time I was 30, than there is between 28 and 20, which is when he was my professor, you know? So I was 30 years old, he was 38, he had never been married, um, uh, but he thinks, he knew, he says now that he knew by the next morning that I was the woman he was supposed to marry. Okay, so, but he was really afraid that I wasn't gonna figure it out. <laughs> now I tell you that story, that's how I met my husband was, a, was, was through music. But here's something else. No matter what you guys are gonna do professionally, one of the most important choices you will make in life is who you choose to spend your life with. <laughs> it's true. I married a guy who is as committed to us, is, it's not about who gives up who they are. And he, I remember sitting on the roof in New Mexico where we were living and he said, you know, there is more we can do together than either of us can do alone. It wasn't about what either of us gave up. And so that was true. Um, and we made it true. So I married a great guy. And I'd say that even if he was here and even though he is a lawyer. Last question. <laughs> Okay, what was the most memorable thing you've done in your lifetime? Most memorable thing I've done? I've probably done a lot of really bad, stupid things that were memorable. <laughs> I, I was part of an escapade that I never got caught at. It was a high school prank that I probably shouldn't tell you about. Um, but uh, I tell you the most important satisfying, I've had a lot of professional satisfaction, um, but I, I have to say that uh, the thing that gives me the most joy is having raised Two pretty good kids. Pretty good kids. You know, we have a, we have different standards for my. We actually have three children. One was uh, was a foster son we adopted, and he was he was an adult by the time we were married. But they, so I didn't I don't take any credit for him. Um, but um, his, my husband was a foster parent before we were married. And uh, but the other two, we, for my son, when he would leave the house, we would say um, we would say, "Don't shame the family." And when my daughter left the house, we would say, stay out of jail. <laughs> so those are the standards. But, <laughs> but they're both great kids, and they're both, um, uh, they're both doing really well, and I love them dearly. And so I've lived a blessed life, and all of you will live blessed lives too. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So I told you she was going to be a rock star, isn't she? So on behalf of the National Security Agency, I just wanted to give a little token of our appreciation from, the, from General Paul Nakasone and the rest of our staff. We'd love to have you come out there. And we have some other special gifts for you from the girls. So I'm going to turn it over to Ashley, because this is an exciting group, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Oh, you have the gifts. The girls do. Good. Where's Emma? There we go. On behalf of the girls, we'd like to give you these. All right. Because <laughs> I am addicted to coffee. One of your two. Secretary Wilson, thank you for sharing your experience with us today, and thank you for being a strong role model for our cyber girls. The impact of your visit will without hesitation be long-lived. Tomorrow, the girls will hear from Diane Genesek, Deputy Commandant and Provost of the National Cryptologic School at the National Security Agency. The Gen Cyber Program is funded by both the National Security Agency and the National Science Foundation, and ultimately 
The entire Gen Cyber program is under her purview. This year, there are 150 camps across the country. Since 2014, Gen Cyber has impacted over 3,300 kids and 837 teachers. And as the largest girls only residential camp, Dr. Rowland and I are thankful she accepted our invitation to visit our program. Thank you for providing opportunity to bring 125 girls from 14 different states to Dakota State University. And thank you for your vision and impact to the community. Over the past five years, CyberHer at DSU has impacted over 10,000 girls. With special thanks to our sponsors at City, SDN Communications, First Bank and Trust, AT&T, and SBS Cybersecurity. We associate the actions of CyberHer in contributing to the increase in women studying cybersecurity at Dakota State University. Since 2012, DSU has seen a 296% increase in women studying in our Beacom College programs. That's my up. We intentionally work to impact each age range from K to gray. Today, <laughs> today I'm very proud to announce a new and exciting program, Rocket Girls a partnership between CyberHer at DSU and cyberspace camps. In one month, 16 South Dakota high school junior and senior girls will blast off to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to, to learn about cybersecurity. Thank you to Cheryl Riley, president of the Northern Plains for AT&T, for, for trusting in our support and for providing support. Our partners at Cyberspace Camp are represented by co-founder Kevin Manson and Stephanie Manson. Rocket Girls are fueled by AT&T, and today we have a few of the inaugural girls in attendance. Please stand. <laughs> For the current Gen Cyber girls, you can now aspire to become a rocket girl in the upcoming years and eventually land here as a beacon bound student at Dakota State University. DSU President Yose Marie Griffiths sends her regards from the STEM K-12 Summit at the White House. She wishes she could be here to see all of you and personally thank Secretary Wilson and Deputy Commandant Jana Sek. Once again, thank you Secretary Wilson Thank you for being here and sharing your words with the girls. Thank you. 